We're going to give you uh, just a kind of an intro to the movie uh, in the sense that the movie deals with this incredible uh, scan that can actually identify heart disease in your body with, with great precision. Uh, and it's hugely useful, but it's being underused at the moment. But the movie doesn't really go into the root causes of heart disease. And one of the questions that's begged at the end is when you get your scan, which I'm sure you will, uh, and you find out you have a high result, and that's, that's concerning, what do you actually do in order to uh, reduce your risk and to fix things? So I'm going to go through a little bit of that. Um, and the title is probably self-explanatory. So any engineers in the audience might resonate with this gag, and I know I certainly do. Uh, so I've been leading complex problem-solving teams for a couple of decades now, and it's been my speciality. So statistical inference, uh, the application of problem-solving theory in practice, and large problems across the world. Uh, and I rather enjoy it, but it can also be stressful. Uh, so my background is chemical engineering some time ago, a uh, biochemical stream, and that proved useful later on in my private life. Uh, I did around 25 years in various engineering positions in management and in individual leadership positions, but always with a problem-solving focus. So in 2013, I got to leverage my work uh, experience when I got some standard blood tests, nothing unusual. But what was unusual was that two of the measures were very high. So they're at way at the high end of the population. And that was a concern for my doctor and for myself. Um, so I went ahead and actually talked to a couple more doctors about them because there wasn't a lot of clarity as to what they meant. And there's two key things with any problem. A, what do they mean for morbidity and mortality? What risk do they entail for illness or death? Because I have five children and I'm concerned with that kind of thing. But B, which is very important, what factors in my life will influence these bad measures and how can I fix those factors and resolve the problem? And there wasn't a lot of clarity in that either. So I got uh, logons to PubMed and ResearchGate and the databases with all of the endocrinology, medical, biochemical <laughs> research peer reviewed for the past hundred years is all out there and can be accessed. And I treated it like a complex problem at work. And I found out a lot. And after a few weeks, I had a root cause diagram, and I clarified what the probable causes were for my particular problem. Uh, and the readings I discovered did mean a lot of risk in the future. And uh, I applied my solution. And in around eight to 10 weeks of applying the solution, the bad metrics came right down into the good place. And all my other blood metrics improved also. Uh, and I was growing to understand these very deeply and their implications, so that was very uh, satisfying. I also lost 30 pounds in weight in that 10 weeks, which again wasn't too surprising when you have grasped how the science works. That, that kind of thing can also happen. So why should you be interested in what I'm going to talk about today? Well, in this room, if an average population of people uh, around 30% or arguably depending on the population more will have a heart attack by the early 70s and many instances that will be fatal. So it is the biggest killer in the world. Uh, it exceeds all the other uh, ca cancers combined actually. Uh, so heart disease is a massive problem, right? And I could tell you or I would be aware of measures that are not too commonly used that could give me a reasonable degree of certainty as to which the affected people will be. So we're going to cover a little bit of that in this talk, and I'm sure you'll be interested in that. So there's three segments to the talk. Uh, has everyone heard that cholesterol or is aware that cholesterol is a, a, a primary or a major driver of cardiovascular disease and dysfunction? Cholesterol, right? Okay, most people. Very good. So we're going to cover that. Uh, the second thing is we've got to move beyond cholesterol to other primary drivers that are of enormous importance. And we're going to give you an idea of what they are. And the third section will be a segue into the movie. And it will just give you some of the data around this incredible test, the CT scan of the heart, which gives you a calcification score. I'm going to explain a little bit of that. So the cholesterol conundrum. Now, I gave a 90-minute talk on this. Uh, and it's on YouTube. It has nearly 40,000 views. And it extended my network around the world. Uh, and it was quite popular. But don't worry, uh, we'll give the seven or eight minute version, okay? But it's on YouTube and you can Google it. 
Now, where does your cholesterol come from, this nefarious cholesterol? Well, it mostly comes from your liver. Your liver makes your cholesterol because it's crucial. It's billions of years old, uh, no cholesterol, no life. It makes up the cell membrane of all your 37 trillion cells. They're gone without cholesterol. It makes the rigidity of the membrane. And it's so important for so many processes and hormone creation and everything else that your liver takes the important job of making it. Now, your liver makes around 80% of your cholesterol. If you're eating a lot of cholesterol, your liver will make less. If you're eating very little cholesterol, your liver will make more because your body knows what it needs for the vast majority of people. Okay? So that's where it comes from. Now, your liver can't send the cholesterol willy-nilly around your blood because your blood is aqueous, it's water-based, and cholesterol is kind of a lipid and it's fat, fat by nature. So it, it won't go around your blood uh, very satisfactorily. So evolution has developed very uh, exotic little boats called lipoprotein particles. You don't need the details. But they're essentially uh, large molecules that hold cholesterol inside and enable the cholesterol to go around your blood safely until it's needed. Okay? And in those little bolts made by our liver, and this is a VLDL. Have people heard of LDL, the bad cholesterol? Yeah, well, it's the bad cholesterol on your panel. Well, that's LDL. This is kind of mother of LDL. This is the initial boat. So you've got cholesterol in there, and you've got triglyceride. And triglyceride is a fatty molecule that's used for energy currency. So you use fat when you eat fatty food, it gives you energy. Well, the triglyceride has to be transported like the cholesterol. So it goes in these boats as well. First port of call for the vessel is to your muscle and or your fat cells. And what happens is, through complex processes, the whole of the boat opens and triglyceride is transferred out to be burnt as healthy energy in your muscles, all your muscles, um, and also to fat cells. I mean, if you're having a pizza and a Coke, and you're watching X Factor, you know, some of it might go to your fat cells, in fairness. An important thing to note, though, is it's not the fat you eat necessarily that makes up all of this triglyceride, because excessive carbohydrate in the diet will be converted in your liver by de novo lipogenesis into these triglycerides. And if you are excessive on triglyceride through that path, you've got a problem. And triglyceride is on your cholesterol panel, too. So make sure when you get a cholesterol test from your doctor that he gives you the full panel. It'll have four readings. We'll talk about those a little later. So, okay, triglyceride delivered, and at a certain point, the boat has shrunk, and it becomes an LDL. It identifies itself. And the LDL at this point, everything's still fine. Evolution made this process. It's fantastic. And evolution is not an idiot, okay? I'll add one more particle, boat, called HDL. And that's what they call the good cholesterol. And it's just another type of boat. And I'm showing here very simply that it has one important function. It is many, but this is one. It transfers cholesterol and triglyceride cargo in and out of the other boats and balances the system. And that works really well as well. And you probably have heard if your HDL good cholesterol is low, that's bad. Well, it generally is bad. Now, the LDLs go back to the liver after around two days in your body. There's two receptor systems in your liver, and they take back in the LDL bolts, and they break them up and take out the cholesterol and process the bolts, recycle, as your body does, it's smart, and the whole process moves on. And that's good. But what if something goes wrong in your environment? What if you do something wrong, inadvertently maybe, and something happens that this system is knocked out of whack. Now you've got a problem, okay? You've got an issue because this whole system will begin to become dysfunctional. And you will see that in the cholesterol panel if you're looking at all four values and if you're able to calculate between them. So, what we're interested in as engineers, or anyone should be, is what are the root causes of what knocks this system off kilter? What are the root causes in your environment? And your nutritional environment is a very important part of your environment with respect to this, okay? If the root causes are there and there's a problem, you will actually be oxidizing those LDL bolts and they will be damaged, and that has a price. So oxidized LDL will not return to the liver so readily, will not be recognized, will tend to promote blood clotting and lots of other problems. So 
but you can't get that measurement. That's a research measurement. You won't get that in your panel. And the cholesterol particles will get smaller, and there's mechanisms behind this. So advanced tests for cholesterol in the States can measure the size, but not in Ireland yet. Okay, so you've got a problem and your cholesterol's being made bad. And that will lead to what we're here tonight to talk about, the inflammatory disease of your artery walls, okay, called atherosclerosis, where you are building up the thickness of the wall, material is building up inside it, you're building scabs or what are called plaques on the inside surface, the inside lumen, and they can break and burst and material can get out into your artery suddenly and cause a heart attack. And that's where a lot of heart attacks and strokes come from. So that's important. But also if you're doing the bold thing here, you're going to drive a lot more disease too. Remember the root causes is where it's at, not the cholesterol per se. The root causes when they're present, and we'll touch on them later, we haven't even talked about what they are yet, will also drive many other bad mechanisms. They will drive a high arterial blood pressure, hypertension, right? And that in turn will cause stress in arteries and will cause flow problems and will promote atherosclerosis. Okay, so that's another one. They'll tend to disrupt your glucose insulin a signaling system and your blood glucose will tend towards rising, particularly after meals. And that is also atherogenic and promotes inflammation and accelerated glycation end products and many bad things. So the root causes here don't just mess with cholesterol. They mess with a lot of other things. All right? Now, we're interested, I'm sure you are, in what are the root causes and how do you fix them, right? So, it's not really just the cholesterol, or in many ways the cholesterol can be a distraction. So we're going to go now beyond cholesterol to primary drivers of cardiovascular dysfunction. Now, I'm going to bring in a researcher and an expert in cholesterol, right, because why listen to me? So, the people who research deeply into cholesterol are professors and doctors who specialize in cholesterol and human disease, excuse me, disease, and triglycerides, and fats, and all of this stuff. They are the experts. And one of the foremost is Dr. Thomas Dayspring, who's given 4,000 lectures or more to cardiologists, doctors, in hospitals, to patient groups all over America. And he's much sought after because he's a genuine expert, and he's been decades. Uh, studying. But I presented him with some data last year or the year before which I'd combined on LDL in the population versus in heart disease victims and I proposed some things to him. And he replied and clarified something which I thought was very useful. In reality, he said, the majority of heart attacks are due to, associated with, and attached to the phenomenon of insulin resistance. Now I want you to remember that term if you take nothing else from this talk. Insulin, the majority of heart attacks related to insulin resistance. And the second thing he said there is LDL is a near worthless biomarker for cardiovascular risk. Not totally worthless, but unless it's through the roof, which is a few percent of people, and that's a different story, that's a separate conversation, it's near worthless. Uh, and he's entirely correct, but I'm just glad he also said it rather than just me. Now, there is a lot of complexity as to why that is the case, and there are a lot of belief systems that LDL is useful, but that's beyond the scope of here. So, if this insulin resistance is the biggest cause of heart attacks, we should be talking about it, right? How many people here are fully aware that insulin resistance is a phenomenon in humans that is enormously damaging and is a huge issue across the population for a long, long time? Okay. We've got a few experts. Very good. But for all the others, the majority who, who might not know so much. Well, I did a little cartoon here. So if this is LDL as a causal driver of cardiovascular dysfunction, yeah, this little mouse here, well, then this is insulin resistance. And in some ways, after all the years and all the data, that scale is reasonably fair. It's not a complete joke. So we'll have to tell you what it is. Now, I'm going to do this in three or four minutes, which is too short, but we've got to be respectful of time. So, you have got a pancreas, which is an organ nestled in your gut, and as you eat things and are absorbed into your gut, your pancreas uh, secretes hormones, which are extremely important. So, they're the control system for your body, okay? These are signaling 
signaling molecules. And one of the primary ones is insulin, okay? Your liver does a huge amount of work, not everyone realizes that, and you've got your 37 trillion cells, and they all respond to the signal from insulin. And that they do it well is very important, okay? So when you eat certain foodstuffs particularly, like carbohydrates, which carbohydrate is pretty much glucose, it's a sugar. Uh, there's fiber in there and there might be some nutrients, but things like rice and bread and potatoes, they're pretty much glucose, they're glucose sugar. Well, that is the primary trigger for insulin to be released. And the insulin goes all around the body and it signals the body, hey, sugar coming in the hatch and we gotta move that glucose into the cells and the liver can convert some of the glucose to other things and you gotta let the body know what's happening. Insulin does that. Insulin even feeds back within the pancreas to suppress glucagon hormone to control blood sugar levels. So insulin is the master signaler, the master signaler. So that happens anyway with those foods, protein less so. Protein less so, but protein stimulates insulin. Fat, dietary fat doesn't stimulate insulin, worth a damn, okay? Now, another notable sugar is, <coughs> is fructose. So glucose is carbohydrate, that's one sugar. Fructose is half of table sugar. You know, honey, table sugar, soft drinks, the sugar we think of as sugar. That's half glucose, half fructose. But fructose is very special because it has to go to the liver for processing, all of it. So the glucose is absorbed into the stomach, gets absorbed in the body. Fructose must go to the liver, and one of the only other things like that is alcohol must go to the liver. So you're probably familiar with that. Same with fructose. <laughs> I know I am. And, uh, so that's fine, and, and this system uh, goes on. But if you eat a lot of carbohydrate, which is glucose, you'll produce more insulin. You know, quite a lot of insulin. Now, we won't say how much too much is, but if you, there is a too much somewhere, okay? So keep that in mind, more insulin. If you eat too much fructose, particularly uh, simultaneously to having too much glucose, because the fructose can get converted in the liver into glucose, but not when there's a lot of glucose coming in. So if you eat a lot of fructose, that has an effect, and it tends towards making your body insulin resistant, okay? which is the body resisting the action of insulin. And in a way, it's a self-protective thing. The body senses too much energy flux, too much sugar coming in the bloodstream. The cells need to protect their uh, mitochondria and their endoplasmic reticulum. We won't get into detail. So it is a natural tendency for the body to resist insulin when it goes too high. But the problem is, if you keep bringing in a lot of glucose, and if you become insulin resistant, it resists the action of insulin. The other half of your body that's secreting a lot of insulin needs to do its job. And it's finding insulin resistance increasingly facing it. So it will elevate and you will get hyperinsulinemic. And this cycle, hopefully you recognize, is kind of a vicious cycle or an engineering catastrophic control loop, feedback loop, because it tends to strengthen itself over time. And over decades, if you keep doing this and pushing the system, there are limits to the human system, you will burn out your pancreas. And the beta cells in your pancreas will not be able to produce the excessive demand anymore. And that uh, state depicted there is essentially type 2 diabetes, which at this point, your blood glucose, which has been held under control by insulin for many, many years, when the insulin begins to flag and it's lost its ability, then the blood glucose rises. And that's the current worldwide test to identify diabetes, is the glucose has gone out of control. So just keep that in mind. Not type 1 diabetes, by the way. It's a separate issue, type 2, which is the dominant form. And then exogenous insulin will be needed intravenously to kind of help deal with the mess because the pancreatic beta cells can't make enough anymore. Okay, now, that's a simplified version of what insulin resistance is. It's a catastrophic feedback loop that grows over many years and can have other causes too. We're going to look now at metabolic mayhem related now, back in the 80s, our story goes back to the 80s, uh, a doctor, Professor Reven, discovered that there were a few key measurements in the human body that if you had three of them or more, you identified yourself as being a special person who had much higher risk for cardiovascular disease, okay, and atherosclerosis. So he knew something was going on here. He didn't experiment with a lot of patients, but he put together a lot of research 
from others as well. And he noticed three out of five, and it's a w, uh, World Health Organization uh, definition for this now, multiple bodies, um, metabolic syndrome. But what they didn't know back in the 80s was if you have metabolic syndrome, and to a greater extent, more likely, it actually predisposes and links to a whole range of modern inflammatory diseases. So I suggest an exercise. Go into Google, put in metabolic syndrome, and put a disease of your choice. That's a substantial one. And you'll get a lot of hits, and you'll have a lot of papers to read, too. So this is important. Um, I'll just mention the LDL bad cholesterol that most people talk about. It doesn't even make the list for the reasons I mentioned earlier. But didn't I say earlier that insulin resistance was the big elephant, right? I said that. Cholesterol, not so much. Insulin resistance. So how can there be another big monster there? That doesn't seem likely. Well, it's not. Because in the last decade, this has been properly called insulin resistance syndrome, right? So you can see where everything joins up now. There's only one big elephant. Okay? And you could actually get away with not measuring all those things and seeing do you have one, two, or three of them, or do you have five of them, am I screwed, kind of thing. You could get away without measuring because David had none of these out of whack. And he had advanced disease, massive disease. But if you had to measure David's insulin secretion after ingesting glucose, or even the glucose after ingesting glucose, then you would have seen the problem. Okay, so if you measure the insulin, essentially, we have a saying in engineering, in quality systems, if you don't measure it, it don't get fixed. And that's part of the problem we have, that one of the best measures you can get for dysfunction uh, is the insulin secretion, particularly post-glucose. But it's not really being used, okay? Now, the final step in the story is to an extremely important guy. And now we're back to the 70s before even. And this guy found out something profound, really profound. Uh, he's a doctor in nuclear medicine, and he was a pathologist who did over 3,000 autopsies personally and cut up a lot of hearts, connecting the damage in the tiny vessels to the people's <coughs> parameters, okay? And he wrote a book in 2008, which I recommend you read, because when I got this book, I nearly fell out of my seat after a few pages, because a few key pieces clicked after years of researching and conversing with my worldwide network. We had to interview him, I realized, at that moment. So myself and my colleague, who'll be with us later, Dr. Jeffrey Gerber, flew to Chicago and interviewed him in the Trump Tower. And Joe was 95 in this picture, so he practiced what he preached. Okay, really nice guy, incredibly articulate, and the interview is on YouTube, you can Google it, and put a lot of work into it, great, great work, I, I think. So he discovered in the 70s, and this is a while back, that diabetes was much, much bigger than anyone realized in the population, much bigger. Because he did 15,000 insulin assays on humans. Patients, walk-in patients, suspected diabetics, all kinds of people. And he took the first 500 home after he did this test. So the test is you drink 75 grams glucose, okay? And usually in a glucose tolerance test or OGTT, you drink glucose and you measure your blood glucose the following two hours. And that's useful. There's nothing like this one. What Kraft did was he was measuring the insulin response in the blood over five hours. And he did 100,000 insulin tests over a period of years to prove his point and prove it he did. He measured the insulin six times over the five hours, actually seven times in many cases. And he got the pattern of insulin response. Now this is pure engineering. This is why I fell out of the chair. And he saw the patterns, and the first few hundred he brought home, and he realized that there's one pattern that's normal response, okay? It's a nice, appropriate response of insulin to the glucose ingested. But there were a lot of people with inappropriate responses. And when he laid all the patterns out on the floor, hundreds of them, he stacked them into the different distinct patterns. And they have not changed to this day, and this is done by Meridian Valley Labs in the US, but there are not many people doing it. These people, he realized, are essentially diabetic. He called it diabetes in situ because he was aware of these people 
right, with excessive insulin, hyperinsulinemia reaction, 90% their blood glucose in a fasting test looked okay because the high insulin was keeping it down, but they still had pathology. 50% or more that would pass a glucose tolerance test, which is taken to be a kind of a gold standard, you know, how does your glucose respond to what you eat? 50% would pass that, but they don't pass this. So this test, switching to today now, 2015, this report came out last, last year actually, and a lot of <laughs> fuss about it. 52% um, up to of the adults in the US are now being acknowledged through glucose and other measures to be pre-diabetic or diabetic. Now to Kraft or myself or Dr. Gerber who'll be here later, or a huge and growing number of doctors who understand this science, uh, pre-diabetic diabetic is all just a spectrum, okay? And if you tested them with Kraft's test, which is quite digital and clear, you would see that more than 52%, we don't know, but probably 60, 65% of adults would fail the most accurate diabetes test. So you can imagine, full diabetics of six to eight times the risk of heart disease. But you've got to extend your diabetics from the 10% that they currently say, because you're talking much bigger numbers, okay? And his statement, Crafts, was many years ago, those with cardiovascular disease not identified with diabetes are simply undiagnosed. And if he's not completely correct, he's correct enough that this should be actioned yesterday. But it's not really happening. Most people will never get an insulin test. And it'll tell you 12 to 15 years before you're diabetic, it'll tell you what's coming. Okay? So, summary of the primary causes. So I said I'd give a summary. And can ask questions later. So insulin resistance, that whole phenomenon, that ph physiological state, whether you call it insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, prediabetes, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, it's all largely to an engineer the same broad dysfunction. Something to be avoided at all costs. What would I do to address this biggest Pareto item, the most worrying one, most heart attacks? I would take minimal sugar, I'd avoid excessive sugar, uh, I minimize carbohydrate down to moderate levels of, you know, fibrous vegetables, vegetable carb, you know, berry fruits, all that kind of good carb, but not, no bread, pasta, or anything like that for me. I respect my insulin. And omega-3 and omega-6 oils. People have probably heard of omega-3 oils. They're the kind of fish oil. They're good, right? Well, they are good. But if you're very high in omega-6, which are the other essentials, then having a bit more omega-3 may not be so helpful. So the ratio of those two is important. And you can get a red blood cell omega index test. Um, I'm not sure in Ireland, but I got them in the States. And that'll pretty much tell you. You should be above 10%. The Japanese are above 10%. Europe's people are around 5.5. America, they're around 4. So, but ideally above 10. So that's another big one. I'll put a few more here, which are kind of not the best of the rest, but there's hundreds of problems with heart disease, but the Pareto principle is to take the top ones that cause most of the problem. And that's what I've tried to do here. So sedentary, lack of light, uh, exercise will promote insulin resistance and other issues. Lack of sun exposure, low vitamin D, we kind of have a bit of an epidemic of that at the moment. Uh, vitamins K2 and C, well not just in Ireland, but they hide even when they have access to it. Um, a few vitamins that are important. Now, magnesium deficiency, I believe, is a very big deal from a lot of research, and I think it's underestimated in the population. The magnesium ion is hugely important around your body. It partakes in an enormous amount of critical functions. So, Sorry, why is yeah. fat not on that list? Why is fat not on that list? Well, the fat can be a problem for sure for a narrow group of people who may have a specific problem with long chains fats. But it's not actually really clear enough that I'm putting it up there as a definite. Now, you also will have a problem with fat if you take in too much carbohydrate and you drive excessive insulin. When your insulin is high, the fat will not be processed safely. So there was a half-truth in the whole thing about fat from 50 years ago. Fats clog your arteries in the sense that people who take a lot of carb with a lot of fat together that is not ideal, and the fat will not get beta oxidized cleanly, and it will be a problem. And that's where I keep the carb low and my insulin really low, so that I can burn fat as the cleanest fuel. 
but I think David might refer to this later. There are specific fats and specific people where lab results can indicate there's a problem, but the global fat is bad is being walked away from by the American Heart Association now after 50 years of driving it. And I can show you those quotes. So it's buried in the report, they're not being too loud about it, but they've acknowledged that all the studies and r randomized control trials with lower fat all failed. They produced no benefit, five of them. And they've also said for every, every percentage of fat or 5% of fat in your diet that you replace with carbohydrates, right, leads to 7% more cardiovascular disease. That's not me that said that. That's the American Heart Association. So they may not be telling you, but they're quietly documenting it. I guess when the time comes and all this comes out, they can say, no, we, we documented that, we said that. So we'll see. It's a complex, Q&A, we might get into it some more. Okay, part three and final part, the power of the CAC. Here is, or are, two CAC scans. It's an X-ray of the heart, and put most simply, with an electron beam, it senses calcium and it shows it up as white. There's your heart, this is a slice across your torso, and there's a guy with calcium that shows up. If you add up all the slices from the electron beam, you can get a score for the total amount of calcium in your coronary arteries. That's it at its simplest. Now on the left we have my uh, colleague and friend, Dr. Jeffrey Gerber, last year at the age of 54, He's looking sprightly, he's been on a high fat diet for nearly 20 years. Uh, he had zero calcium, which you would expect because he knows a lot of what I'm talking about. So, uh, No calcium, effectively no disease. <coughs> nice, right? You see the clarity here. And then the guy over here might have, I don't know, five or six hundred. David's score was 906, okay? And he's got a lot of calcium. Now the calcium is brought in by your body in inflamed areas of your arterial network. So when you've got inflammation, and the problem I referred to earlier, because the root causes are driving inflammation, right? Your body recruits calcium in, and in a sense forms bony structures to shore up. So think of a plumber coming in, and you've got a part that's leaking in your pipe system, and the plumber wraps it up with tape. Doesn't fix the piping system, doesn't fix what's causing the problem, but he wraps it up with tape and you give him some money. Well, calcium is what your body does to try and patch up damaged areas that could burst and could clog an artery, okay? And that's it. So a high score means a lot of disease, no score means you got a warranty, okay? Now, what do they use currently to decide? If they don't use calcium, which they don't, and David's gonna to talk to that and, and the panel. If they're not using this calcium score, which is an engineer's dream to be quite honest, right? What are they doing? They must have some test. Well, they do, they ask a few questions. So they ask you some stuff about cholesterol and smoking and your HDL, good cholesterol, and you know, they vary a little. But all over the world, this is what you get. Want to know if you're going to get a heart attack, whether you need to be medicated, a few questions. Framingham is the town in Massachusetts where decades ago, in the 40s it started, they just tracked the population of the town and they measured all of this stuff, right? And then after 20 years or so, they looked at who had heart attacks and who didn't. And they saw, well, the people with the lower HDL tended to have more. People with smokers tended to have twice as much. So it's loose data, right, from years ago. But it's easy. But this does not measure disease by any way, shape, or form, or imagination. This is, in engineering, this would never be used. Uh, it's a statistical guess. So you get put in a box based on a few questions, a rough idea. That's not measuring disease. And this is the muddy waters of the methods that are used now. It confuses everything. So that's what's being used. So let's look now at those questions. They give you a percentage risk in the next 10 years, right, a guess. The people who get 3% in this system, if you actually scan them, this is real data, with a, with a CT scan and get a calcium score, suddenly you find out, hey, they're not 3%. Some of them are really low, they have no calcium, like my buddy Jeff. Nice job, doing the right thing. Some of them have 18% chance in the next 10 years, because they have uh, over 600 calcium. Do you see the difference in granularity and specificity? Here, don't know what's going on. Over here you know where you stand, and here you can take action, okay? More interesting to look at people who get a 10% out of the guessing game. 
They're now talking about medicating people based on reaching a 10% in the Framingham. Medicating. <laughs> but if you scan them with a CT scanner, you find out their actual risk. And there is enormous data behind calcium. There'll be guys in there who are fine. They may have got a high score because of the high cholesterol, which has <laughs> big problems we won't get into. And they're doing the right thing. Those guys over here, they've got to take immediate action. There are stories and letters written to David, for instance. There's one of them where a guy went in and got a test. Doctor said he was fine, a bit overweight. Score was so high, they immediately rushed him to a cardiologist. Immediately. And the doctor said, I never would have guessed. Got a calcium score. So he found out, right? So from this muddy waters, you can be in great shape, bad shape, shocking shape. Muddy Framingham takes a guess, and you'll hear the Framingham again. Calcium sees the disease. It's an engineering test. It's precision. Okay, couple of studies. Smoking versus CAC score. They took a whole load of 50-somethings, few risk factors, you know, not the fittest guys in the world, and they took their calcium scan at the start of a, I think it was a five-year study. Thousands, I think they had four and a half, five thousand people. And they took the scans and they broke them out into low scorers. Say, so, okay, these guys are low scorers, non-smokers, and at the end of the study, one of them dropped of a heart attack. That's pretty good. But he got a low calcium score, so he's going to have a good outcome. That is quite good, actually, because they had people up to their 60s as well. It's not bad, 1% chance. The smokers with a low score, but they're smokers, and that's really bad, right? They had a 2% dropout for heart attacks. And that's the double your risk of, of smoking, you know, it kind of doubles your risk. Really bad thing, you wouldn't do it. But what about the guys who had a high score. Non-smokers who came in with a high score had six to seven times the risk of smokers with a low score. So calcium blows away even smoking versus non-smoking as a risk with ease. <laughs> These guys here thought they were the same as those guys. Hey, slap in the back, I'm a non-smoker. Bullshit. <laughs> calcium fixes that. Missupposition. Uh. So that's important. Here's an even more important one. Again, thousands of people, excellent study, and they pulled out people with high calcium scores at the start, but they thought, if you have a high calcium score, you've got a lot of risk, right? But what if it's not increasing over the years versus it's really continuing to go up over the years? The latter guys are going to be worse off. Didn't know how much worse off. I'll tell you what happened. These guys here, who had a very high score like David, with huge potential risk from that score, because they increased by less than 15% a year, and they tracked them, they were the low increasers. They actually came out with a pretty damn good result. They beat the odds. Now, they weren't doing anything special. They were lucky. The root causes, they must have happened to address by coincidence. Or maybe they knew what they were doing. So. What about the guys, same guys at the start who get a thousand, up to a thousand score? Same guys, no one knows the future. What about those guys, but they track them and they do increase by more than 15%. So maybe they're a thousand at the start, then they go up to 1180, and then they go up to 1370. They're increasing above the 15% level. They've got stuff going on. The root causes are still there and working. In 3.5 years, not even six, that's what happened to them. Now, that's not even Russian roulette, because Russian roulette is one bullet, six chambers, it's a 16% chance risk. This is one cartridge and a double barrel shotgun, and you get to pull the trigger over three and a half years. And I'll stress, these guys here, none of these guys knew what was coming. Only the study, study authors were tracking this. The guys just went about their lives. So it'll give you an idea of the power and predictive power of calcification, especially when it's rising. But you won't know what's going to happen. You won't know your score is rising, especially if you don't get any bloody score in the first place. Okay? So that's, that's important, very important. Now, final slide, and this is it. A few points that David feels strongly about, as do I. Um, CAC score is now in the guidelines. It's in the ESC 2013 guidelines. It tells doctors for the first time in 2013, use this for middle risk people. You know, fuzzy framing them, ooh, not so good. Use this, okay? But no one knows about it. I've asked people, I've asked people in hospitals as well who run the scans, and they say, no, we don't really do them anymore. So no one really knows. 
A CAC score of zero report came out last year or two and it was entitled a 15 year warranty for a human. Because they looked at the data again, they said a score of zero means you're so unlikely to have a heart attack or die because it affects all cause mortality too. It predicts many other diseases besides heart. You basically got a warranty for 15 years if you have a zero. Think about that. So there you are, Jeff. Lucky guy. Would a woman be asked five questions to guess if she had breast cancer? We might give you some chemotherapy, but we just ask these questions first and take a guess of whether you got breast cancer before we give it to you. No, that's what's happening with heart disease, right? No one would accept. You got a mammogram. You can go and you can scan and find. You got a CAC for heart disease. Okay. With TB, they were scanned. They identified people with them without TB. They worked on them. They followed it up. There was granularity and clarity. And look what happened. Heart disease has been in fuzzy land, it appears to me, for decades. The arguments against CAC, and I will preface the movie with just going through a few of these, and they are infuriating to a technical person to have to listen to them. Radiation levels. We don't want to give people radiation. There's less than half the radiation of a mammogram. And no one's giving out about mammograms. And mammograms are regular, whereas CAC only needs to be done once for the vast majority. Maybe done in six or seven years then, just to check in, right? No randomized control trial has proved the CAC can predict. I've shown you the numbers. No diagnostic scan has ever had a control trial. They don't need it. You just look at the statistics. Control trials are for drugs to make sure they are effective and they don't kill people. It's crazy to suggest a randomized control trial for a diagnostic method like this that's fully understood. It doesn't identify soft plaque. Yeah, but it's damn better than anything else around. Soft plaque is plaque that's beginning or is not calcified yet, and it can rupture. Okay, but that argument is, okay, it's really fantastic, this test, but it's not 100% perfect, so I don't want to use it. Risable. It's costly. It's cheaper than a service in your car. You won't need a car if you go down with a heart attack. <laughs> okay? So that one is, you almost wonder, are these guys like practicing for some comedy event? But this is said by very senior specialists and highly respected people all over the world, and you'll see some of this in the movie. And my favorite little gem is, the CAC now for some years is obligatory for all presidents in the US before they take office, and all astronauts before they go into space must have a CAC or no go. So think about it. What about you guys? I know what I think. And that actually is the end of the material. So we're not actually going straight onto the movie. Uh, Ross, I'm not sure Ross could make it. Excellent, Ross. I would like so, to just make two points. First yes. of all, 7% of heart attacks are plaque rupture. So the focus on, on the main arteries, it happens outside the main arteries. So that's a really important issue. This is why trying to identify people uh, before they have an event. So, yes. you know, people go from straight being well to dead very, very quickly. I think that's really important in, in, in people, people understanding it. And it's a non-invasive 200 euro dollar, 200 euro, it's a non-invasive test. It's not a, it's not an invasive, it's just a... It's a quick, I did it myself there a few months ago and it's a five minute you will slide in, you hear the GE machine whirring, you're back out again, they have to score immediately. Computer calculates it. It's that quick, exactly. Now I know, oh I did forget one thing Ross, sorry, just a moment. It's just the data, David, that you had furnished uh, just really quickly. And essentially the point from this data, this shows the distribution of scores for the population. And the essential point is, if you take someone in their 50s, uh, the top 25% of scorers get 75% or more of the heart attacks. And that applies to all ages. And in fact, older people, the framing of noise is even less accurate. So the calcium is even more important for older people. And I won't show it today, but the calcium, there's a recent report came out and said, is calcium scanning the predictor for most modern diseases? And they've gone through all the data and the, the, the hazard ratios for cancer and for a load of other diseases are just incredible, which makes sense because the underlying inflammatory dysfunction, right, won't just drive atherosclerosis, like any complex system. It's gonna drive everything out of whack. So that's it, so thanks very much. Oh. Is it good?